So hopefully this works out. So we asked to do this in R. Do the <clears throat> using P norm. So again, kind of helps to draw out our area. Helps us keep track of what areas you know we're going for. And, and actually the P norm works really well because you don't have to worry about flipping it like you do with, with working with the table. So Number one, worms are normally distributed. What's the probability to get one that's greater than 33? Well, P norm 33, that's our, that's our number. X is greater than 33. We're dealing with the mean and standard deviation. That's our distribution. And since, uh, they say less than, P is less than 33, is that right? Now, what's the probability you will find a worm larger, larger, yep, larger than 33? I had that right. All right, so since we're larger, we're to the right of that point, so we'll use lower dot tail equals F. And when I run it, I get 0 0.07656, which is, ours is 0 0.0764. That's what we did by hand, but if you remember, when we did our division, we rounded. So when we use the calculator of that uh, 33 minus 28 divided by 3.5. I think we said it was 1.42. We we rounded to get that number. Uh, R didn't. Actually, R went to more decimal places than, than what we did. So their number is going to be slightly different. Number two, we had, here's our NFL scores. What's the probability that we're going to score less than nine points? So it's X is less than nine, so P norm nine. We've got our mean, standard deviation, and then since we're to the left of that, we're going to use lower dot tail equals t. And ours is uh, 1056, so again, rounding, we had a round, so we're slightly different. Number three, calls, 1.78 with standard deviation 0.6. What's the probability of getting, having a phone call go between one and two minutes, All right? So we drew the curve, we know what slice we're looking at, so what we can do is take everything to the left of two, so lower out tail equals t, and then subtract out everything to the left of one, lower out tail equals t. And that gives us 0. 0.45, no, 0. 0.5462 or 0. 0.5463, which again, Slightly different than what the table gives us, but we rounded. We had a round. And our last one, 68, we have 70 and 3, lower dot tail equals t minus the p norm, lower dot tail equals t. So I look at, at my big slice and I subtracted the, the, the smaller slice out of it. Could we have done it the other way? So with like this height, could we have reversed it? Yeah, so we could say P norm of 65, where our mean is 70 and SD is 3. But now I use lower dot tail equals F, so everything to the right of 65, that could work, and then subtract out everything to the right of 68. So I'm just going to copy and paste the last part of it. And you'll see we get the exact same thing. We get the exact same thing. So just as long as we have, have an image of the, slot, the slice that we want, we're going to take the bigger slice and we're going to subtract out the part that we don't want. And that would be probably the easiest way to do it. All right. Not too bad. Oops, let me move this over. All right, so recommendations. When you have a problem like this, 
you, you're going to probably recognize it. You're going to see it. You're going to see it uh, on our next exam and on the final exam. So when you get a problem like this and I say, yeah, something's normally distributed, what's the chance that we get a, an item less than or greater than or between some values? Draw a rough sketch. Right? Just a regular bell curve works. We're going to utilize our numbers. We can label it. Right? It doesn't have to, look, have to look exactly like it should, but it's going to be something like a curve. And what we're going to do is shade in that area that we're looking for. And that'll help us keep track of if we're going to be less than or greater than, or probably a little bit better to say, it'll inform us inform when we use lower dot tail equals t and lower dot tail equals f. All right. If we have to, we can subtract out areas. So take the bigger chunk minus a smaller chunk to get a slice, or maybe it's like. Uh, you get a question that's like, what's the probability that we're going to get, uh, find an item that's more than two standard deviations away? All right, and that more than two standard deviations could be on the positive side or the negative side. So instead of taking a slice, we're actually looking at two tails. Well, as long as it's the same, you can just figure out what that tail is and multiply it by two, or you add the area of those two tails. So once you know what area you're looking for, then generally, if you're going to do it by hand, you convert to a z-score. Right. And then from that z-score, you utilize a normal table. But if you're going to do it in R, just use p-norm. Don't even do the z-score. p-norm of our x value. Give it the mean and standard deviation, and then you will you know if it's lower dot tail equals t or lower dot tail equals f. All right. So is there a trick to remember T and F which sides they are? Yeah, left is, is T and right is false. So lower dot tail. tail. So lower dot tail. Lower dot tail. Typically the lower tail is that way and the upper tail is that. So just if I get rid of that and just do a, a typical curve. Let's do that. Let's say that's a T, T distribution. So it's not a normal. It's a T distribution, let's say. We've got these tails here. That's a tail, and that's a tail. So typically, this is our upper tail, and this is our lower tail. So in the formulas, it always asks, do we want the lower tail? If we do, then it's true. Lower tail equals true. We wanted the upper tail as lower tail equals F. All right. But that's in reference to the area to the left of our point or area to the right of our point. So it's not just it's not just the normal distribution, it applies to the T distribution. Chi square distributions are typically are almost always your right tail. Uh, F distribution is almost always your, your upper tail. Yeah, it's a true false. If it's lower dot tail equals T to the left, or lower dot tail equals F to the right. And if you ever do one of these p-norm problems and you get a p-value that's greater than one, you did something wrong. So our, our, our probabilities are always going to be between zero and one. All right, so we've been talking about normality. But we know that not everything is normally distributed. So if we violate normality, it's going to be a violation of usually these two, skewness and kurtosis. So we'll ignore the bimodal or multimodal cases where we've got multiple peaks. We'll say we have one peak, all right? So one mode, we can be skewed or we can be kurtotic. So skewness, talks about our tails. Are we long-tailed or not? All right. If we skew to the right, that means we have a tail on the right-hand side of our curve. I remember it as saying, if we're skewed right, then we lean to the left. So this curve, if this is what it should look like. It should be balanced. But if we start tipping to the left, 
now we've produced this really long tail. So we've got more values in the upper end, at the upper end of our distribution than, than what we need, or than what we should have. All right. If we lean more towards the right, then we, what we get is a longer tail on the left-hand side. So skew left means we lean to the right. Skew right means we lean to the left. All right, what is that? How does that affect our means, medians? Well, we have the relationship up here again. So if we are skewed right, our mean's going to be higher than the median. If we skew left, our mean's going to be less than the median. All right, and this is why, you know, basically the skewness is, is when you'll, you'll notice it because there's just certain things that are always going to be highly skewed. Home values, salaries, and so forth. So if you hear in the news or read anything uh, about incomes or home sales, and if they use average, your warning bell should be going off to say, whoa, 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 that's a skewed distribution. Why are you using averages? Well, if you use the mean, it makes things worse than it is. So you know, home prices. If an article is saying, hey, home prices are way out of control, way too high, in that article, I almost guarantee that they're going to reference the mean because it's going to be larger than the median because you have those one or two homes that sell for two, three, four, five million dollars really pulling up the, the mean. So that's where skewness. Kurtosis is peakedness or shoulderedness. And I think, I think we, we kind of talked about this before already. All right, so we can have leptocurtic, which means we have more points in the middle. More points in the middle. Um, and less in the shoulders, or we can be platycurtic, which is less in the middle and more in the shoulders. All right, more in the shoulders. Uh, ways to keep track of this, I just think of a duck-billed platypus. That's all I think of. Why the platypus? Because it's got a duck bill, it's flat, hence our platycurtic, it's being flat. That's how, that's how I've always remembered it. Klepto is pointed. Uh, those of you that have had parasitology, which is nobody in here. We have a, a larval type, Leptocircus circaria. Leptocircus meaning a pointed tail. So, more pointed. All right. All right. So, deviations from normality. That's where we're going. Any questions? All right, so how do we identify if we have deviations from normality? Well, we can test for it. What's that? All right. Now, I'm not going to say we test for it. Rather, I'm going to say that we're going to assess one. And the, sh the simple reason for why I don't want to use test is because the actual hypothesis test for normality isn't very good. It's, susceptible, it's very susceptible to sample size, the effective sample size. So what I'm going to teach you is more about assessing normality. How do we assess if our underlying data are normally distributed or not? All right, so why do we check for normality? Well, one, it's an assumption for a lot of our parametric tests. So that assumption is that the data are normally distributed. Right? If they are not normally distributed, then our test results could possibly be wrong. Now, some of our tests are robust against violations of normality. Others are very sensitive to the violations of normality. So one of the first things that we're going to have to do before we get into our hypothesis test is to determine is our data normally distributed? Or are our data normally distributed? If we determine that they are not normally distributed, then we can look more closely at the underlying distribution. Because sometimes the actual shape of our curve will tell us about some important biological process. All right, so skewed data. Okay. This could reflect a difference in mortality rate. So perhaps you have uh, really high mortality rates early on in life and then very low uh, later in life, 
And what you end up getting then is a size distribution that's skewed. Many more individuals older in life because they can survive, they can live, they can persist for a longer period of time. All right, that could be interesting. Maybe that's an interesting biological process that you, per, you plan to pursue. Curtotic data, it's peaked or uh, platycurtic. Oftentimes we look at selection, at the response to selection to determine is this a strong pressure or is this a weak pressure? Stronger selection pressure should be more forceful in getting us close to an average or close to the value that's being selected for. Weak selection pressures will, will generate more variation, more of a flatter type of curve. So again, maybe we're interested in that. Other times we're not. Other times we're just interested in running the stats. We check normality, and if it's good, hey, we proceed with our test. If it's not, let's choose an alternate test. So how do we check for normality? There's going to be graphical assessments and then more of a statistical assessment. All right, so if we're with our graphical assessments, what we're going to do is visually inspect our data. And this is where our assessing comes into play because it's going to be subjective. We're going to look at it and we're going to subjectively determine whether we think our data are normally distributed. Statistical assessment is not very subjective at all. It's actually objective because this test will generate a p-value. If our p-value is less than 0.05, we reject our claim that our data are normally distributed. If it's greater than 0.05, then we say it is normally distributed, and we'll talk about this. So what we're going to do is we're going to introduce these three types. We've got, we're, we can make histograms of our data and then overlay a normal curve and see how well it fits. We can do quantile-quantile plots, uh, which is we're going to use the CAR package to do that. And then our test is Shapiro-Wilk normality test. I will tell you right off the bat, the one that we should favor doing is this quantile-quantile plot. That's the one that we should do. That's the one that we will be doing as we get to our statistical tests. So to get into this presentation, what we are going to do is generate three types of data so we can see what things look like when we violate normality. All right, so let me, I have my R open, and I'm going to make a new, new markdown document. File, save as. So I've started up my R markdown. I've got it set up so I'm going to call this assessing normality. That's what this is. I'm going to generate my data first. All right, and I have the data that we're going to generate on our slide. So we're going to first set the seed. All right, why do we set the seed? Yeah, so we all get the same number. And then we're going to do a yes, a no one, and a no two. So yes is just meaning that we're going to generate a random sample. 200 value random sample from a normal distribution. That normal distribution will have a mean of 75 and a standard deviation of 5. All right, so I'm going to generate our norm. So a random vector of 200 items, mean of 75, standard deviation of 5. And then we're going to have two different no's. Get this in here. DF1 equals 5 and DF2 equals 20. No 2 is RT. 1,000 DF equals 10. All right. So here it is. All right, so we did our norm. I'm going to write this down. 
All right, so our norm generated our, our random data from a normal distribution. RF is going to generate random data from a F distribution, Fisher's distribution, F distribution. All right, so in the normal distribution we said it's defined by our mean and standard deviation. For the F distribution, it's defined by two degrees of freedom, because the F distribution represents ratios. So it's going to be a numerator degree of freedom, that's our DF1, and then a denominator degree of freedom, that's our DF2. So again, we could have an infinite number of, of curves. And it's a continuous, continuous uh, distribution. And then our last one is RT. So we will generate random data from a, a T distribution. I'm going to use this appropriately from a T distribution. And that is lowercase t. It's a student's T distribution. T distribution is, the, is defined by degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom is a uh, discrete type of degree of freedom. So in theory, we could have infinite number of values because we can be infinitely large. Uh, but we're re restricted to whole numbers for our degrees of freedom. Uh, we can approximate I don't think T's can approximate the decimal degree of freedom. Yeah, well, just T tests, I think, could approximate. We're generating distribution. So our first one should be normal. So we're going to see what a normal distribution looks like at every single step. And then we're going to see two different examples when we violate our normality. We're going to see what they look like. All right. So first off, method, histograms. And I don't think the uh, highlights uh, transferred over into PDF. So histograms with the normal form. The graphical uh, Usually when you start your data analysis, you look at a histogram of all of your, your variables. All right, and that's really, I think I told you, one, one of the reasons is to just check it. Do we have any like really far numbers? Maybe it was a data entry problem. All right, so if I'm going to make a histogram, one of the things I like to do is just overlay a normal curve just so I can get a, a sense of is this going to look normal or not. Sometimes I don't because it looks very far from normal, uh, but you know, other times I do. So this is a two-step process. First we're going to create the histogram and then we're going to generate the curve. All right. And with an option, when we generate the curve, so both of these are graphical functions. So typically if we run a graphical function, it'll create a graphical device. And then when we run another graphical function, it'll create another graphical device. In this case, we're running a second graphical function, but we have that add equals t, because it's one of the functions that we can add to the previously generated graphical device. So we're going to create our histogram, and then we're going to overlay a normal curve. Now, it is a little bit tricky, because you have to remember what we're doing, what, what terms get changed. So we're going to do a histogram of our variable of interest. All right, It could be a vector or it could be a vector inside a data frame. And then we adjust the number of breaks until we get it looking a little bit better. We, we need it to have enough breaks to where we can see the data, but we don't want so much where it's just like completely all over the place and it's hard to tell if our curve follows. All right, so this is somewhat trial and error. Once we run the histogram, then we're going to run this function, curve d norm x comma mean bar sd bar. All right? I didn't highlight x because we don't change that. It is going to say d norm comma x. And then we're specifying a mean of our vector and the standard deviation of our vector. So we're going to generate a curve, a normal curve, based on the mean and standard rate deviation of the underlying data set. Now, what does this x do? When we issue the denorm function, it's going to look at the graph 
that we just generated, and this is the add equals to. It's going to look at the graph that we just generated, and it's going to look at the x-axis. And for every point on that x-axis, it's going to add a very small point because it's going to be those points that form our line. All right? And this is going to work the same with any distribution. So this is d norm. If I wanted to, I could do a chi-square overlay. I could do a t distribution overlay, an f distribution overlay, etc. I could do all of them. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna be doing this. Um, actually, I think I've done that. Yep. All right, so we're gonna start with the yeses as kind of an example. So generating data. So this will be a, a histogram with. A, normal curve overlay and we're going to use the yes vector for this all right so in our code we've got a two-part process first make the histogram all right so this will be hist of our very vari variable breaks and frequency equals F, I believe. Yep. All right. Second, add the curve. This will be curve and then d norm of x, where we have a mean of our of our variable, sd of our variable, and add equals t. And I'm going to do one more. I'm going to do color equals red to fix out. All right. So we've got two steps, and I haven't talked about what this frequency does, uh, and and we'll show you. All right. So. Here is the uh, histogram and curve for the yes vector. All right, two-step process. So I'm going to first create my histogram. Histogram of the yes vector. All right. We'll do breaks equals 10. I don't know what to start with. Actually, I'll leave that off. I'm going to do hist yes all right, and frequency equals false. And I'm just going to run that. Oops, I didn't run this. Make sure after you do your generating the data, you actually run it so it, so it appears. So I'm just going to do this and see what it looks like. All right. And this is what your frequency will do. The frequency equals F changes it from a count, telling us how many items we actually see, to a density. So frequency. Actually, it's not a frequency. Proportions. A frequency could be a percentage or it could be an actual count. So that's kind of a confusing part. So this is proportions. So what this is is that this highest bar is almost 8% of our of our data. And probably a little bit more, but that's what we're looking at. So I can see this. That's, this is six bars, so let's try breaks equals 10 and see what that looks like. Okay, that's not bad. All right, if I go up to 20, I bet it's going to be real... Eh, 20 is not terrible. It's not super great. Let's see if 15 makes a difference. I think 15 and 10 are the same. Yep, 15 and 10 are the same, so I think I'm going to leave something like this. If I change this frequency to, to T, you'll get the idea. Here's 30. So you can see, you know, this bar is almost 30, 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 and so forth. So if I do frequency equals F, that gets a percentage. And that's that's what we want. That's what we want. All right. So I think that looks okay, and now I'm going to run my curve function. 
So the curve that we're adding is a D norm. So D norm is that density. It's the probability density function. So we, the X will pull the X values from our graphical device. It's from the, that histogram. But we have to give it a mean because the D norm is defined by the mean. And we have to give it a standard deviation. All right. And we want add equals T. We need color equals red. All right. And we're going to run it. Oops. Let's fix this. I'm going to go to this. Y lim equals a vector from 0 to, let's do 0 0.15. We'll try that. Ooh, that's not good. We'll do 0 0.10. That's a little bit better. All right, so the histogram looks at just the underlying data and tries to make sure that your figure, your bars take up most of the space in that, in that graph. All right? When we did that, our normal curve got cut off right at the top. So what we can do is adjust our axes to make sure that this curve looks normal. And you do it with this. So y lim and x lim are the limits for the y axis and the x axis. I think the x-axis looks okay. If I wanted to add extra values to it, I could. But I'm going to say that looks okay. But I do need to increase my y limit. So for the y limit, you give it a vector of the smallest, uh, so a vector of two items, the smallest number and the largest number. All right, so this gives me the y-axis limits from zero, that's going to be the base, all the way up to point 0.1. And you saw, I started at point 0.15, and my graph like, only came up maybe halfway. Not very good. Change that to a point 0.1, and this looks better. It captures the curve and everything else. Uh, are you going to have to do the Y limb all the time? No. If you left it off on an exam, I'm not going to count off. I can see you're doing it correctly, but it's just one of these extra things. And then the curve, you can see, worked. It ad added an overlay. And I'm going to add one more thing. Oops. I'm going to do LWD for line weight or line width. I'm going to shift that to 2. So the default is 1. That's what a, one of the red lines look like. When I change that to 2, it's going to make it thicker, make it more prominent. All right. So here. We can look at this and say, well, how close does our histogram match the curve? Does it okay? I mean, there's some deviations. So you can see here, right in the middle, we see fewer items than what the normal curve would suggest. Here we have more items. We got more items here. We got fewer items here, more items here. I mean, it's bouncing. You're not going to get exact, right? And this is part of the assessment. Would we say that this is normally distributed or not? Well, I'd say it's close. This isn't my preferred method uh, of, of assessing because it is kind of difficult to, it's, it's much more subjective than our quantile quantile plots. All right, so yeah, we know the data is normally distributed. This is probably close, close to it. All right, so. Uh, so we use some special options in the code above okay. for the hist function, all right, ylim uh, and I'm going to do xlim as well, even though we didn't use xlim. So x lim is a vector low to high, y lim is a vector low to high. So these 
set the lowest and highest values on the x-axis. Right. And this one set sets the lowest. Copy this. The lowest and highest values on the y-axis. So that allowed us to change our, our axis limits. I'm going to change values to limits because I think that is a little bit more clear when it says x lim and y lim. So x limits and y limits. And we can, we can apply this type of thing for any of our graphs that have a continuous continue, uh, numeric axis, numeric axis. Discrete axis would also apply. For the curve function, we use cull All right. that sets the color of the line, and LWD will uh, end uh, number sets the width of the line. And LTY, we didn't use it, but LTY sets the type of line. So if we wanted to make it a dash line or a dot dash dot line, we could. All right. So you might see that. Are we going to use it? I, I, I don't know. So you might be thinking, oh, cool. I can change all this color. If I use red, maybe I want blue. Gonna use blue. I get it. What if I want yellow? Yellow works. Yellow is hard to see. What's that? Never use yellow. What's that? Don't ever use yellow. Don't ever see it. Can on a black background. Right? So uh, let's try that. Let's see if that works. No. Can't remember how to get I can't remember how to get the background up here black. <laughs> But you can. You can do that. Can you make it a white line? Yep, you can. Yep, of course. You can make it a white line. See? You can kind of, you can see it. Yes, just, just so you know, when I was in kindergarten, I got called up by the teacher. She was mad. She accused me of not doing my, not completing the task of coloring in all the sheep. I used white. <laughs> Well, I guess I'm one of the few that actually colored cheap white. But yeah, you can do other ones. So uh, I typically use red and blue. Good. Uh, there you go. Red and blue. But what if you wanted to view what colors are available to us? Colors. Yep. Antique whites. See, you can go antique whites. One, two, three, and four. Right? You've got all of these that you can use. Corn flower blue, corn silk. Gray. You've got 100 gray. You got 100. So gray is all like from like gray 1 all the way up to like gray 99. So the shades of gray is what, you, what you're dealing with. Oh, gray 100. Uh, can you yeah. go back up to the, is it colors or? Colors and then open and close parentheses. Gotcha. Yeah, colors, open and close parentheses. These are all of the colors that you can reference by name. So make sure you refer to them in quotation marks. Uh, if you wanted to refer to colors by like uh, RGB numbers, you can. If you wanted to do hex, you can. Uh, I think. Uh, yeah, um, there's a lot more that you can do. So palette sets the color of our palette. So I'm going to hide that. I'm going to go to a console just so you can see it. Uh, oops, I want to rip my typing. So uh, you know, I think you've all have done, like worked in Excel before and add, add you know, made figures, made bar graphs, with different series or whatever. And Excel has a set number of colors. 
right? R does too. So if we start doing groups and start adding more lines, uh, or we make a graph that's going to automatically group things, it goes down the order, down its palette. So black is the default color, and then this color's next, this color's next, this color's next. So those are the hex values. I'd have to look to see what those hex values are. Uh, on my computer, they actually list the color name. So if we wanted to change the palette, the default palette, and specify, okay, I want red and blue and then, you know, like green instead of yellow to appear next, like Excel is awful. Yellow always like was like the second color that they used. We could do that. But as I've said before, if you're going to make figures in R, come talk to me. I'll help you out. I'll help you out and get, get, it, get it working. But here's how you check all the colors. You are free to pick any color that you want. So I don't even know what this burly wood is. Burly wood. Oops. Is like a, I guess a brownish color? Goldish? <laughs> is there gator? What's that? Oh, the, I mean, I haven't checked out all of these. Uh, what is it? Uh, corn. Flower blue. I think it's cornflower blue. I think I saw. There it is. That's not too bad. That's almost like the Excel default blue. All right, so that's histograms. Yeah, brown, black. Yeah, there, so yeah, check it out. I, you won't get counted off for not using red or blue. All right, so the other one is the quantile quantile plots. All right, so there is an option in the base package where you create your 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 quantile quantile plot and then you add a one to one line and that's a, a two step process and that's a kind of highlighted that two step process but we're not going to do it because this way doesn't add a 95% confidence interval where the confidence interval allows us then to judge whether or not our data points are normal all right so, what we're going to do is use the QQ plot function in the car package, all right? The car library. So we have to load the car library first in order to access this QQ plot function. So I'm going to go back to my R markdown, and I am going to create a new thing right at the top called the required libraries. And here, I'm going to load my car library right off the bat. And you're going to start seeing this appear on our exam, where we've got required library section, where any library that you're going to use in that this document needs to go here. So I'm going to run that. Uh-oh, what the heck happened? What the heck happened? Oh, uh, let's take that out. Did you get an error? It made me load car data on time before I just load car. Are you kidding me? Yes. What the heck is going on here? It didn't do this before. Hmm. There is no package called zip. I guess we'll do, let's see if we can install a zip package. Because that is ridiculous. Okay. I'm going to take that card and data out. All right, so now I loaded the zip package. There it is. Maybe? 
There it is. So that error message that I was getting, I had to install the zip package. I don't know why, but we did. So anyways, we've got the car package. That's loaded. And then what we're going to do is use the QQPlot function. Now the QQPlot function takes a vector. So for us, we'll just have vector yes and no one, no two, and so forth. It also takes the option of a distribution, all right? So we can, get, we can make a quantile quantile plot for any distribution that's built into R. The default is norm, so the normal distribution. And this is the only one that, that we'll make using quantile quantile plot. So all of my quantile quantile plots, my QQ plots, will just be QQ plot and then our vector. And what it's gonna do is generate one of these quantile quantile plots and gives us a 95% confidence interval. So let me shrink that. All right, so now we are dealing with is it two of them. Quantile, quantile, plots. All right. So our quantile, quantile, uh, actually what we'll do is this. I'll describe it and then we're going to create this. Create the plot so we can look at it and I can describe it and then we'll go back and add in the text up here. So our function is qqplot. All right, so the function is qqplot of a vector. All right, qqplot of a vector. And again, we can specify the distribution, but we're not. We're not going to specify the distribution. Oh, this is new. This is a new addition to the car package. All right, what's that? What's it say? Are you getting the same error that I had? Yeah, yeah, that works. That loaded. Yeah, it's in there. All right, so what it generates is observed quantiles and plots it against predicted quantiles from a normal distribution. So remember, if our predicted quantiles match the observed quantiles, then our distribution follows whatever distribution was, was generated or was used to produce those predicted. So in this plot, the yes part, this gives us our observed quantiles. So it starts at the smallest value and say, okay, this is out of 200. This is our 0.5 percentile. That next point is the 1 percentile and 1.5 percentile, and 2 percentile, and so forth. So it keeps adding it. And based on that, it compares it to what the normal distribution would predict based on the mean of that yes vector and the standard deviation of the yes vector. So it knows how quickly it, the quantile should jump up in this range when we're within that one standard deviation away. The plot then adds a one-to-one -one line so if we match that distribution, in this case, if we match the normal distribution, all of our point points should follow this one-to-one -one line. So it means our prediction matches what we observed. But what's more is that it adds this 95% confidence envelope. All right, so it says, yeah, there's a chance that our point could fall not on the line, but off the line. And based on the number of data points that we have, it's going to set up this envelope to, to allow either more variation around that line or less variation around the line. All right? So our rule of thumb when assessing normality is that nearly all of our points should fall within the confidence envelope. All right? If we don't fall inside the confidence envelope, then we're probably not normal. But there's, like, exceptions to that. There's exceptions to that. So the bulk of our data points in our middle distribution should fall on that line or at least within the confidence zone. Here you can see some points, outlines are falling outside, that's okay. 
because what matters is the center of that point. And that center of that point is still inside the envelope. Outside, you can notice the envelope gets wider. Those are the areas where we will allow some of our points to fall outside. We're at the range where we're at our extreme. The probability that we're going to get one of these extreme values is pretty low. So it makes sense then that we're going to allow some of our points to fall outside the envelope at the extremes of our distribution. All right, so our quantile quantile plots, our quantile quantile plots plot the uh, observed quantiles against quantiles predicted by the normal predicted if our vector is normal with the mean of our vector and standard deviation of our vector. So I guess I should say is normally distributed with mean of the vector and SD of the vector. vector. If our data are normal, and our points should follow the uh, follow the one to one line. So observed matches predicted. We use the ninety five percent confidence envelope. to help us assess normality. All right. Oops, I'll leave that off. So, what happens? So what happens if we violate it? There's our one-to-one -one line. All right. If we violate normality, then we will not be falling on that line itself. We're going to fall off the All right. Most likely violations would occur where our points look something like this. curved. So we'll probably fall outside the confidence envelope down here and down here, but we are definitely falling it outside in the middle. And that's a bad thing. It's not just one point. It's multiple points outside of that envelope. Another situation is maybe like this. Now the opposite curvature. Again, we're outside of the points near the end, but and we're definitely outside in the middle. These are both non-normal types of curves. And then you could have something that looks like this. So you've got your points that are in the envelope, and then you get more of like an S-shaped curve. And it could be the other way too other S-shaped curve. All right? These are clearly non-normal because we've got curvature. Our lines are exhibiting curvature that don't fall on, along that one-to-one -one line, but more importantly, they fall outside of that 95% confidence interval. All right? So if we go back to our, our markdown, all right? our rules all right, so when they fall within the confidence envelope, our points should fall inside the 95% confidence envelope, so CE. We allow a small number 
to fall outside the 95% confidence envelope only if they are at the ends of the distribution. So at the, at the lowest or at the uppest, uh, at, at the lower end or at the upper end. By small number of points, we are talking 5% or less. And in some cases, 10% or less. So in some cases, we can let it go up upwards of 10%. Others, we restrict it to 5% or less. All right, this difference, 5%, 10%, kind of comes down to sample sizes. All right, so that's what I have. Obvious curvature, that's non-normal. And when it's non-normal, when it, we have that obvious curvature, we're outside the point, that confidence envelope, and we're outside in the middle part. Or you're going to have an excessive number of points outside a 95% confidence interval. Usually in this case, we're dealing with outliers. Or we screwed up when typing in our data, entering in our data. That's the other thing. All right, so this is what we, we created. Uh, this was created in the old, with the old car package. And I think this looks better than the new one with the blue, but whatever. We'll have to deal. I'll have to look to see what I can do to eliminate that. But yeah, here's our histogram. We made it. Looks like we made it to brace 10. All right, we did our overlay. Yeah, kind of looks like it. But this isn't as clear as a quantile. quantile plot where we look at that and say, yeah, all of our points are inside the envelope. We are normally distributed. Looks good. All right. Questions? All right. What we will do is stop here on Wednesday. We'll do a quick review, and then we will let you do the nose on your own. See if you can get a histogram and a quantile, quantile plot. All right? So we're doing the nose in class on Wednesday? Uh, I mean, you can play around and try to get it to run. Uh, I was going to give you some time, so if you had errors, I can come around and look at it and see, see if I could point out what what was what was wrong. All right. All right. So that's it. We've got the homework. I'll take questions from the homework, uh, but I think what we'll do is uh, anyone that's watching that has questions, email your question. So that way we're not just running this live.